we'll address chest trauma here, and I've split this up into two parts, uh, primarily because there's so many topics uh, to discuss, and so uh, I, I didn't want to make this a two-hour review. So uh, just some overall principles of chest trauma. We give specific consideration uh, to uh, the airway and breathing. And you may be thinking, well, aren't we focusing on airway and breathing all the time? And the answer is yes. However, when you have chest trauma or even neck trauma for that matter or head trauma, what we're really, really concerned about is, uh, is a, an injury to the airway structure itself. And so we really have to consider proper airway and breathing uh, even more so in chest trauma. All patients who have endured chest trauma or who are suspected to have endured chest trauma should be placed on not nasal cannula, but a 100% oxygen non-rebreather mask because hypoxia is the most important feature of chest injury, and it's really what drives uh, the, uh, the, the, how the patient is going to uh, fare. I mean, there are other things too, like getting a good diagnosis and treatment. Uh, however, hypoxia is an independent risk factor uh, for mortality uh, in chest trauma. So we want to make sure that these patients are well oxygenated. Shock can be present in chest trauma. Uh, note that when you have head trauma, typically we don't see shock because you're in kind of a limited area. But with chest trauma, you can get shock. This can be due to blood loss. You have the great vessels in the chest, which certainly can bleed enough to cause uh, a, uh, a shock. You can also get shock from intrapleural pressure. So what we're thinking about here is tension pneumothorax, pressing on the heart. Uh, you can get uh, shock from a, uh, a vascular disruption. You can get shock from myocardial dysfunction. Uh, you can also get uh, shock from a cardiac tamponade. So shock is another thing to be thinking of with chest trauma. So we want to make sure that we're monitoring the patient's blood pressure. Another very important feature of chest trauma is the patient's pain level. So uh, what does a patient need to be doing to satisfy their ABCs? They need to be breathing. But if you have chest trauma, in a lot of instances, you're going to have pain. And if it's too painful to breathe, it's going to be difficult to aerate all of your lungs. And you might think, well, if they're oxygenating fine, if they don't have hypoxia, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is in patients, older patients uh, in particular, we are very concerned about atelectasis. Atelectasis occurs when you're not oxygenating your entire lungs properly, from the base to the apices. So if a patient is only taking uh, shallow breaths, they're not taking properly deep breaths, they're putting themselves at risk for atelectasis, which can progress into pneumonia. And as you know, pneumonia can be deadly in older patients or in patients with immunocompromised uh, states. So as a rule, in general, for everybody, we want to make sure that the chest wall pain is adequately controlled, not just for relieving the pain. I mean, that's a good thing, too but to make sure that they have good pulmonary toilet, that they're able to make nice deep breaths and aerate their entire lungs. We'll talk more about that uh, in a few slides. So I, like I said, I sort of divided this up into two different parts. We're gonna talk about uh, the various cardiac, uh, I'm sorry, the various uh, airway injuries uh, here. I, didn't uh, include in this one the cardiac injuries and the diaphragm injury and the uh, two of the complications that can come out of this. So we'll talk about uh, tension pneumothorax first. So attention pneumothorax is a disruption of lung tissue causing a progressive accumulation of air in the pleural space. Typically, the pressure in the pleural space is negative. What you have here is a disruption of tissue, and as you breathe, air gets into the pleural space, increasing the pressure because this is uh, a fixed, I wouldn't say fixed, but it's a, it's a limited space. Uh, and as the air goes in, the pressure goes up, and that's going to collapse your lung, 
But the other problem with tension pneumothorax is not only does the air go into the pleural space, but it can't come out. So every time you breathe, you're increasing the pressure in that uh, hemithorax, in that hemipleural space, just one side. And so as the pressure in the pleura goes up, this intrathoracic pressure goes up, what's going to happen? It's going to put pressure on your heart. And when, you're when your heart uh, is compressed, as what happens in tension pneumothorax, the cardiac output goes down because the heart has no room to expand or it's trying to expand against a high pressure. And so the output goes down and this ultimately results in shock. Now there's many different things that can cause shock in a patient with trauma or a patient with chest trauma. So how do we tell this apart from other kinds of shock? There are some things that make this unique. First off, a patient with tension pneumothorax will tend to have distended jugular veins. And the way you can remember that is basically this patient has acute congestive heart failure. Their heart can't pump. And so because their heart can't pump, blood is get, getting backed up in the venous system and it's distending the jugular veins. Also, they're going to have absent breath sounds on the affected side because their lung is collapsed. So they're not getting oxygen into that side of the thorax. So the absent breath sounds are really useful because... Uh, when we come to talk about cardiac tamponade, we'll also see that those patients have uh, a shock and distended jugular veins, but those patients don't have the absent breath sounds because their lungs are fine. Another thing that you might note on physical exam is that the affected side will be hyper-resonant to percussion, and that's just because of the pneumothorax. So if a patient uh, has gotten a chest x-ray, and they shouldn't, but if they happen to have gotten an x-ray, the chest x-ray will also demonstrate the clap. You'll have a loss of vascular markings, as you would in any pneumothorax. And you also should see, with attention pneumothorax, a shift of the mediastinum to the non-affected side. Now, why is a chest x-ray something that you shouldn't get? The reason is because you want to, you, you should be able to diagnose this clinically. A patient who's in shock should not be being wheeled in, they shouldn't be going in for imaging. So these patients, you're going to want to treat them immediately. And for the most part, attention pneumothorax, uh, where you have some kind of trauma, uh, the distended jugular veins, absent breath sounds, hyperresonance to percussion, shock. For the most part, this is an, uh, an easy clinical diagnosis. And what you're going to want to do then is a needle decompression. So you take a 16 uh, gauge needle uh, and you're inserting it into the second intercostal space at the midclavicular line. And a good way to find where the second interclavicular space is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, second intercostal space is, is to feel for the manubrium. So remember that manubrium is just the very top of the uh, very top of, of at your chest where you've got that jugular notch. Um, and then uh, palpate down, uh, it's probably about two or three uh, finger lengths uh, down to the, uh, uh, the second intercostal space, and uh, then you'll palpate over to the midclavicular line, so the middle of the uh, clavicle, so where those two lines come together. I think I got picture. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh, best initial step is not a chest x-ray. Here you can definitely see that this patient has a pneumothorax, and they have a very high pressure in their left hemithorax, but, and they also have the shifting of the mediastinum, shifting of the trachea, but you don't want to get a chest x-ray. You want to diagnose these patients clinically because these patients are in, in severe danger. Okay, so, uh, like I said, you just palpate for that uh, jugular notch. Uh, that's the manubrium. A few finger lengths down, you have the manubrio-sternal junction, where the manubrium and sternum come together. It's kind of a little bit of a bony prominence, and you just go lateral from there until you hit the uh, intra or uh, midclavicular line, and then you put a needle in. So that needle, then, what you should hear is a rush of pressure out that needle. And that's the pressure that's built up in the thorax. And what happens from that, then, is not a conversion of the pneumothorax. The, the lung is still going to be collapsed, 
but you won't have the pressure pushing on the heart. And the, the main problem with tension pneumothorax, at least initially, is the shock. So this will relieve the shock, but then you're going to have to put in chest tubes in these patients to keep the air out. Now an open pneumothorax, or what sometimes people call a sucking chest wound, is also a pneumothorax. However, in this case, you don't have that valve mechanism, that one-way valve mechanism. So you just have an equilibration of atmospheric pressure with your hemi intrathoracic pressure. So you're not building up a pressure, so you're not uh, causing compression on the heart. So this does not cause shock. However, it's still a pneumothorax because a pneumothorax is where the lung has been collapsed and you now have air in your pleural space. So uh, in this case, you have an equilibration of atmospheric and hemi intrathoracic pressure, but you don't have the uh, rising intrathoracic pressure that's causing compression of your heart. So similar to tension pneumothorax, the lung is collapsed and it can't exchange oxygen. So oftentimes this will cause dyspnea. Similar to tension pneumothorax, you won't hear lung sounds on the affected side because the lung is collapsed. And a lot of times there'll be hyperresonance to percussion because there's air in the pleural space. But unlike tension pneumothorax, uh, with the open pneumothorax, you, uh, you don't trap pressure in the, hemoth uh, the hemithorax, and so there's no compression of the heart or vena cava. So this is not as much of a, an emergency as tension pneumothorax, but it's still something that needs to be urgently treated. So the diagnosis here again is clinical um, and it's based on the presence of a chest injury and your typical physical exam findings. Uh, remember if the patient has shock though with these findings then you're, uh, it's a tension pneumothorax and you're going to treat this differently. So the chest x-ray uh, should be obtained provided that the patient is stable and you'll see similar findings, loss of, of lung markings, vascular markings, uh, on one side. The treatment is uh, to apply sterile gauze over the wound and tape it on three sides so that you're still allowing the air to get out. Uh, and then this will be followed by tube thoracostomy and wound closure. So that uh, if you were to, if you were to uh, tape this on all four sides, what you'd essentially have then is you, you're converting it into a tension pneumothorax because now air can't get out. So you don't want to do that. You want to just seal it on three sides. But these patients definitely, definitely need, need a tube thoracostomy after that. This is just a temporizing measure. So here's a three-sided wound closure. And this will be followed up by tube thoracostomy uh, and then definitive closure of the wound. Which will probably need to be debrided. A tracheobronchial disruption is a disruption to uh, the airway, and this is uncommon, but it's devastating and uh, can be life-threatening. It is life-threatening in many cases. About 80% of patients die before receiving medical attention. So basically what happens here is that uh, your upper airway uh, has some kind of uh, trauma to it, some kind of compromise, and now you're getting air trapped in your tissue um, like skin tissue or uh, tissue in front of the uh, spinal column, uh, between the spinal column and the esophagus. Uh, so you're developing air where you shouldn't have it. And that air will collect. And so the tracheobronchial disruption is also a problem because these patients also, in many cases, don't have a patent airway. And, so, and, and when you have a disruption to your airway, it can be difficult to intubate them. So that's another problem. Like I said, 80% of these patients die before receiving medical attention. The 20% that don't, they'll present with respiratory distress, hypoxia, hemoptysis may be present because they've had a, an injury to their airway. There may be bleeding into their airway, bleeding into their lungs, which they might cough up then. Uh, another thing you'll see that's a little bit more specific to tracheobronchial disruption is subcutaneous emphysema. There you have the air leaking out of the airway into the skin. Uh, and you'll note that in the neck and upper chest. The patient needs to be intubated because most of the air that they're breathing is going into tissue, not going down into their lungs as it should. Uh, 
Uh, if the patient is stable, or once the patient is stabilized, a chest x-ray can offer some important clues, including pneumomediastinum and subcutaneous air. If tracheobronchial disruption is suspected, the most accurate diagnostic test is going to be tracheobronchoscopy. So a chest x-ray can give you clues, but it's not the most accurate diagnostic test. That's going to be tracheobronchoscopy because by looking with a tracheoscopy or a bronchoscopy, you'll be able to see the injury itself, and then you can send the patient off to the OR to have their, uh, to have their injury corrected. So here's pneumomediastinum. You have collect a collection of air in the mediastinal space. Here. So that you should have, I don't know what to call it, a contiguity between the silhouette of the heart and the diaphragm. There shouldn't be this air space here, this opacity. Not opacity, this black space. What do they call that? Uh, lucidity. Lucency, that's what the word was. I'm not a radiologist. Okay, here is a pneumopericardium, so you have air between the heart layers. And this can also happen from a tracheobronchial disruption. Okay, hemothorax. This is an, an accumulation of blood in the pleural space, usually due to trauma damaging the chest wall, lung parenchyma, or other vascular structures. This is typically seen with penetrating chest trauma because it's a penetrating trauma is something sharp that's stabbing you uh, or uh, burrowing in, and that can that will also typically damage vascular structures as well. So the symptoms are going to depend on the severity and the amount of blood lost. Often this includes respiratory distress to one degree or another. Uh, tachypnea, hypoxia, and in some cases, there'll be hypotension and narrow pulse pressure. You can lose enough blood from these injuries to where you'll have shock. That is possible. Another thing you can see on your physical exam is dullness to percussion, because if you have bleeding into the lung space and you, uh, and you percuss that, you'll hear a thump because it's fluid. So this is something that makes it a little bit different from uh, a pneumothorax, and that you can have a collapsed lung uh, and the tachypnea and the respiratory distress and all those respiratory symptoms. However, here you have dullness to percussion in, uh, on the affected side rather than uh, hyper percussion. Diagnosis can be made either clinically, if, especially if it's emer an emergency, or you can uh, get a chest x-ray. If you do get a chest x-ray, you should get uh, both uh, an upright lateral and an upright AP uh, chest x-ray. And the reason that you get upright is because if the patient's laying down, you're going to see blood covering the entire uh, chest cavity uh, or the entire hemi chest cavity. And that doesn't really tell you how much blood is in there because it's kind of spread out. If they're sitting upright, then it's gravity dependent, and so you can kind of see a, a, a rough measurement of how much blood is in the cavity. Now, that's, that's not going to matter because you're going to do a tube thoracostomy regardless, but it gives you an idea uh, to, uh, before you go in with the, with the tube. So a tube thoracostomy is the uh, initial management of choice in most patients. You're going to go straight in and do that if you suspect uh, a, a hemothorax in an emergent patient. Uh, you should always be ensuring hemodynamic stability, have O negative or cross match blood on hand for transfusion. So here is a hemothorax. This patient is sitting up, and you see the blood, this opacity area in the uh, left hemithorax. So here's another one. I'm not sure if this patient has a severe hemithorax and is sitting up or if they're laying down and they have a hemithorax of questionable uh, severity. But if you, if you were to be laying down, you might get something like this, even though in reality it might be you know, something like this, just on the other side. Okay. So with hemothorax, there, uh, there are some indications for immediate therapy. So you're going to do an open thoracostomy, uh, 
in in some cases. So when you, you put the tube in, right, you're going to get X amount of blood. If that amount of blood is more than one liter, a thousand cc's, the patient is going to be sent off for an immediate thoracostomy. Now, why do some patients get an open thoracostomy and some patients don't? It just depends on what vessel is damaged. So you could damage a, a, a major artery or you could damage some low pressure veins. And with the low pressure veins, you're not going to get as much blood loss as if you were to damage a ma major artery or a major vein. So if there's more than 1,000 cc's of blood retrieved from the initial tube drainage, then you should uh, send the patient off for an immediate thoracostomy for repair. If there is more than 200 cc's per hour drained for four continuous hours, then you should send the patient off for open thoracostomy. And if the patient decompensates after they were initially stabilized, then you should send them off for open thoracostomy. So the initial approach is uh, by placing a chest tube. Uh, however, open thoracostomy is done in certain scenarios. So the rib fracture is the most common injury sustained during blunt trauma to the chest. Typically, it's associated with high energy trauma, particularly motor vehicle accidents, but you can see it in sports as well. The major symptom here is exquisite pain, and it's the pain that really drives our treatment and drives the complications. You can also note on your initial physical exam, local crepitation. The patient will often find it difficult to breathe, primarily because of pain. When they're breathing, it'll primarily be shallow, rapid breaths, because the deeper they breathe in, the more they're expanding that chest cavity and worsening that pain. So they'll try to breathe as quickly as possible, well, as, as shallow as possible, and as quickly as possible to maintain good oxygenation. Now the problem is not that they're not getting enough oxygen. A lot of times they can do it with the shallow tachypnea. However, the problem is, like I mentioned, getting that entire lung oxygenated and expanded because if you don't, you can de develop atelectasis and pneumonia. So, like I said, it's that pain that really drives the problems here. They may also have features of hemothorax. Remember, you've got a fracture, and fracture pieces can be sharp, and that can uh, cut an artery. You, know, you could also have signs of pneumothorax. Pneumothorax, again, similar reasons, because you have a sharp uh, a sharp bony fragment that can damage the airways. Uh, or you can have uh, a flail chest, which is really just severe localized rib fractures. And we'll talk about that next. So when you suspect a rib fracture based on physical exam or history, the best diagnostic test is a chest x-ray, and the chest x-ray will show you the rib fractures. Treatment is, as I've mentioned, focused on preventing complications, namely atelectasis and pneumonia, by maintaining good ventilatory function. Now this is really, 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 really important. You may have some patients who, you know, like a 15, 18 year old who got into a minor car accident and they got one small rib fracture. Are we as worried about them going into pneumonia? Not so much because they're otherwise healthy and they're, uh, they're young uh, and it's only a small injury. Uh, we're still going to make sure that we prevent complications, but it's not that patient population we're as concerned about. What we're concerned about are the 70-year-old little old ladies who have rib fractures from a fall or something of that nature, and old, older people, especially people with other lung conditions like COPD or cystic fibrosis, they can die from pneumonia. And so rib fractures can be a deadly condition in the older population or in the immunocompromised uh, patient. So the treatment is focusing uh, on preventing complications and maintaining good ventilatory function. So to do that, we manage their pain. We want to make sure that they don't have any pain uh, so that they're breathing fully. They take nice deep breaths in and out. And so we can do that really with any pain medication, acetaminophen, NSAIDs, usually those aren't enough though. Uh, usually you'll have to go to opiates, but the problem with opiates is that one of the side effects is respiratory depression, and that's the exact opposite of what we want with these patients. Some patients will need opiates, or they'll prefer opiates. Um, opiates are certainly easier uh, than what I would prefer to do for a patient, 
Uh, but uh, the better treatment, in my opinion, is the intercostal nerve block. And what an intercostal nerve block is, is just a, a local anesthetic for the, the ribs and you're, uh, you're anesthetizing the, uh, the, the nerve that goes around the rib. And by doing that, you won't have the side effects of opiates. Uh, but like I said, a lot of patients won't want that. They'll just want morphine because not only does morphine work faster, you don't have to get poked, but, you know, it gives you a little bit of a high. So either are fine, but intercostal nerve blocks, in my opinion, are better because you don't have to worry about respiratory depression. And then incentive spirometry is also important. The incentive spirometer is just a little uh, device, and usually the nurse will watch the patient use it to make sure they're doing it, and it makes sure that the patient is getting their lungs aerated and ventilated. So with rib fractures alone, Healthy patients with just one or two rib fractures um, with mild to moderate pain that can be controlled on oral pain medication can usually be sent home with instructions. However, patients with severe injuries, concomitant injuries, patients with respiratory illnesses or the elderly, they should be admitted for observation. And it's not just respiratory problems we're worried about. We're also worried about patients who have severe injuries we're worried about them developing pulmonary contusions, which is a complication of rib fracture. So this is the intercostal nerve block. You can approach from the back and you just feel for the spinous process and go uh, palpate the rib, you draw this line. Uh, some people like to draw on patients. And then it's the uh, midclavicular line. You angle your needle at about a 20 degree angle and uh, you can use various different uh, medications, local anesthetics. Uh, lidocaine is commonly used, but I prefer to use bupivacaine because it lasts longer, and so you don't need to be poking the patient all the time. So some complications of rib fracture include flail chest, which we'll talk about before this uh, lecture is over, pulmonary contusion, as I alluded to earlier, Another problem is atelectasis, going to pneumonia, as we try to prevent by making sure the patient is aerating properly, and then pneumothorax and hemothorax. This is an incentive spirometer. Obviously, this one's for a child, or I suppose for a playful adult. Uh, but what you do is you have the patient blow into this, and they want to, it's important to keep a nice, steady, long uh, expiration, not a uh, not a hard ventilation, and the way you know that you're doing a proper uh, expiration is that this little there's a little ball in here, and uh, you want to keep it in the right range. So for this, you want to keep it in between the branches. For this one, it says you, may, you might not be able to see it, but it says like good, better, and best. So you'll want to keep it in the best range. All right, a pulmonary contusion is basically a lung bruise. So this is an injury to the lung parenchyma, and it involves edema and bleeding. And it's not so much the injury to the lung parenchyma that's a problem, it's this edema that's a problem. Because if you have edema fluid in the lungs, you can't use that part of the lungs for oxygen exchange. So the more pulmonary contusion you have, the less of your lung is available for oxygen exchange, and that can cause... Uh, hypoxemia, and so forth. So this is really a bruise of the lung. So you don't necessarily see this on your initial chest, chest x-ray. The patient comes into the ER, within an hour you get a chest x-ray. Their lungs may look fine, apart from a few, uh, a few uh, rib fractures. What you're going to want to do is get a chest x-ray, if they have damage to their ribs especially, uh, you're going to want to get a chest x-ray within about six hours because that's going to show you if there's any pulmonary contusions. And what pulmonary contusions are is edema and bleeding in the lung parenchyma, in localized spots of the lung parenchyma. And this is just like a bruise. Think of, think of how you get a bruise. Somebody comes up, and they're just joking around, and they, they punch you kind of hard on the shoulder, and you're like, oh, oh, that hurt. But you look at it, maybe a... a half an hour later, and there's nothing. It looks fine. But then you wake up the next morning or that evening, and you see this black and blue spot. 
This is exactly what a pulmonary contusion is. You have an injury, but a delayed uh, response to it. And uh, it will be that edema that will decrease oxygen exchange and lead to the complications. So this is rather common. About 30 to 75 percent of all blunt chest trauma cases will develop a pulmonary contusion. The worse the trauma was, the worse the pulmonary contusions will be. Pulmonary contusions are associated with hypoxia in a patient who may have previously been doing better. So you admit a patient to the hospital for observation, they're oxygenating fine, now suddenly their, uh, their saturation is in the 80-85% range. And you wonder why, because they were just fine a couple hours ago, pulmonary contusions. So this is more of a, a post-injury, a delayed response injury. The best way to diagnose this, just get another chest x-ray. What you uh, should notice is these little patchy infiltrates consistent with uh, edema and bleeding into focal areas of the lungs. So you'll get a chest x-ray for this. The treatment is simply supportive care. There's nothing we can do to take the pulmonary contusion away. But we do know some things that would make the pulmonary contusion worse, and that is volume overload. So we have to be very, very, very careful in giving them fluids, because if they are uh, hypervolemic or you, you're giving them too much fluids, uh, that will that all that fluid is going to go into those leaky capillaries and that injured space in the lungs, and that will worsen the contusion and hence worsen the hypoxia. So if you do need to give fluids, you should use colloids and also consider the use of diuretics to maintain a euvolemia, if not a slight hypovolemia. Uh, so uh, what do we do in general for pulmonary contusions? Do we admit them? Well, the problem is usually we don't know if the patient has a pulmonary contusion when they're in the ED. It takes a while to develop a pulmonary contusion, usually several hours. So the rule of thumb is if a patient who has chest trauma is elderly, sick, they've had multiple trauma, or they have a concurrent respiratory illness like COPD or cystic fibrosis, or they have multiple uh, chest injuries, multiple rib fractures, uh, which could lead to several contusions, then they should be admitted. However, young patients with just mild contusions or maybe just one rib fracture, two rib fractures at the most, they can be discharged home because for the most part, they're not going to uh, their pulmonary contusion won't be that bad when they develop it. Remember, with pulmonary contusions, it's related to the severity of the injury and how many rib fractures or how many injuries are present, because this is a post-injury. What else do we do? Well, like any uh, uh, chest injury, we're going to give them supplemental oxygen. We're going to give uh, do chest physiotherapy. Uh, because we want to make sure that they're uh, oxygenating their entire lungs. These patients usually have rib fractures as well. Uh, and then we'll also uh, maintain uh, a good fluid level, not overdoing it, and uh, serial chest x-rays to monitor resolution. These usually go uh, away within days to a week. So here's a pulmonary contusion. This isn't, would appear this isn't that bad. Of course, it just depends on the patient. So it just kind of looks like pneumonia, but it's not like in a lobar consolidation or anything like that. It's just like a, a, a bruise on the lung. And the rib fractures are right here, these red lines. Flail chest is a loss of bony contiguity of a portion of the lung, and this interferes with normal expansion. So why would that happen? Flail chest is not caused from just simply multiple rib fractures. It is multiple rib fractures, but with flail chest, you have to have multiple rib fractures, usually three or four, in this, in, in, roughly in the same area. And what happens then is that if you have enough rib fractures in the same area, the lung is no longer going to be attached, contiguous with the chest wall, and that's going to interfere with lung expansion in uh, that part of the lung that's no longer attached. So usually this is secondary to a blunt force that results in multiple local rib fractures. The patient will present as any other chest trauma or rib fracture patient, and the most obvious symptom is going to be what we see in any other rib fracture patient, which is pain at the site of injury. They can also have respiratory distress and hypoxia.
Now, what you'll see a lot of times in USMLE questions, but doesn't come up as often in real life, is this so-called paradoxical movement of the chest. So when they breathe in, you would expect their chest to expand, but the part that has flail chest, the injured part, will actually move inward as if they were breathing out, and vice versa. So this is only present in about 25% of patients. So even if you're, if you're thinking flail chest and you don't see this, that doesn't mean they don't have flail chest. But if they do have it, that's, that's, a, very, that's a very specific sign. So for diagnosis, uh, just get a chest x-ray. Uh, that will identify the multiple rib fractures. And uh, based on the other clinical signs, you can diagnose the flail chest. Really what this is, is uh, a lung that's detached from the wall because of multiple rib fractures. Uh, the way you treat this is not going to be a whole lot different than the way you treat any other rib fractures. So you want them on 100% oxygen non-rebreather. You want them with uh, good pain control uh, to allow for normal breathing. You can do either local pain control or opiates, PCA. Uh, like I said, I prefer uh, to do local pain control because I don't then have to worry about the patient having respiratory de de depression. Um, and then chest physiotherapy. Very important that the pain control meds are used for pain control uh, to help the patient breathe. They're not used for sedation. If they are sedating the patient, you're probably giving, giving too much. And sometimes the patient won't tell you that they're sedated or they won't tell you that uh, it's enough because, again, opiates are a drug that give you pleasure. So you should use contracts. These patients that are given opiates, if they're given opiates, you need to make sure that they're using their incentive spirometer. That's absolutely quintessential. You should get a follow-up chest x-ray on any patient with flail chest, just like any patient with rib injuries, uh, to look for pulmonary contusions, also to look for a widened mediastinum because you can get a traumatic injury to the aorta that's subclinical if you have uh, a rib fracture in the right area. So that's something that you can look for on your chest x-ray, the widened mediastinum. Uh, since in pretty much all cases with flail chest, they will develop pulmonary contusions to a certain degree. You'll want to restrict fluids, just keep them euvolemic, uh, even a little bit on the hypovolemic side if you can get away with it. Uh, if you do need to give them fluids, use colloids and diuretics to maintain euvolemia, nothing more. Serial arterial blood gases are good to uh, know how well they're oxygenating. Uh, and then a spiral CT of the chest, a lot of times clinicians will get that in addition to the chest x-ray uh, to look for any signs of damage to the aorta, which is a possibility with flail chest. And that's not just because of it being flail chest, that's because when you have flail chest, there was probably some kind of really, really, really severe chest trauma. Not just the kind of chest trauma that might break one rib, but chest trauma that breaks several ribs, and usually that's like a car accident motorcycle accident, a really high fall if you have uh, uh, osteoporosis, something like that. So these are all things that you can do. But the most important thing, pain control, make sure that they're using their incentive spirometer and check for pulmonary contusions and treat as appropriately. Marked hypoxia, hypercapnia, or inadequate breathing, uh, sedation, altered mental status, these are all indications for mechanical intubation, uh, as you know. However, in a patient with flail chest, because they have rib injuries, you want to make sure you place bilateral chest tubes because when you intubate a patient with, with chest injury, they're at risk for uh, pneumothorax. So rather than waiting for them to have a pneumothorax or waiting for something bad to happen, we're just going to place the bila uh, chest tubes bilaterally right away and so then they won't go into pneumothorax. Here is uh, an x-ray from a patient who has flail chest. And so see if you can find the rib injuries. And they're right here. So you've got one, two, three, four, five that I can count, just looking at it right now. Uh, five rib fractures within four contiguous ribs. So this can definitely cause flail chest.